So how are you doing? Very good, and you? Not bad, not bad. That's a cool mug. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks again for agreeing to do this. So you know, I've got my little YouTube channel um, where I talk about businessy things, and I thought it'd be good to get somebody on. I've never had somebody on, and it's, uh -huh. I kind of wanted to start to do interviews. And I thought, I, uh, you know, yeah, you seemed like a, a a good candidate to start with because you talked about a lot of things that I talk about on my channel. So, right. Um, yeah, and I'm also I'm quite interested because of what you said your evolution was, you know. Yes. So uh, why don't we uh, get into it and, and give us a little bit of a rundown about okay. that. Well, why don't you introduce yourself, um, which is probably complicated, <laughs> right? I should, I'll try to give you an elevator speech then so uh, please be with you phil so jim kukachi here i currently serve as the international president of toastmasters international toastmasters is an organization around the world it started in 1924 we empower people to become more effective communicators and leaders so now we've got about 330,000 members in in 136 countries around the world so i've got the great honor of that uh, serving in that volunteer capacity for another two months or so and then rest through some other offices. Um, personally, I, uh, I live in St. John, New Brunswick here in Canada, a small city of about 120,000 people here on the East Coast, a wonderful small city. And I um, spent 30 years with a telecom company. I think we'll explore the career a little more deeply as we, as we progress here. Mm -hmm. So currently, I am uh, doing some work consulting uh, with a uh, with, uh, of companies as I manage my significant volunteer responsibilities and I prepare for those ending and stepping into a more substantial uh, role in business. I, mm. uh, I'm a guy who's driven by a need to achieve things, to get things done, so uh, I'm looking forward to the transition. I'm enjoying every moment of my position, but uh, I'm very cognizant that uh, there will be a transition taking place. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you come not from maybe an executive stream background but from a more technical background right true uh, so my start uh, when I came out of um, uh, community college way back in 1981 I was trained as a COBOL programmer so I uh, came to work for a company called New Brunswick Telephone which was a was a huge innovator back in the day and I spent uh, about 10 years in IT positions and I was I enjoyed that and I was very strong at that those skills but uh, it's interesting Toastmasters folds in because one day two engineers I was doing some work for came to my desk and said you're a pretty smart guy but you see me you need some help with that I'm scared of a group but I developed very quickly in Toastmasters in a supportive environment and that caused a, a desire for other change and that, that happens a lot with people in Toastmasters they come with modest ambitions and the confidence grows and they look for opportunities so I did and I looked in my company and sales and marketing seemed to be what drove revenues and drove the organization so that was the move that I made I spent four years in sales and the rest of the years in marketing where I continue to work um, so that was a transition that I made interesting I mean not a lot of technical people make the jump well from technical <laughs> to sales and marketing I suppose, yeah. I'm not sure what the stats are, but um, it, uh, it's interesting. I have talked with some people. It's, it's wonderful if you can because to have the technical capability and credibility to understand some of that world is, is very, very helpful when you're uh, dealing with customers. And, you know, I think because as myself, coming from the technical side, I, I think we always lament that uh, the sales and marketing people don't have more technical knowledge you know it's true and it's an interesting bridge and that was my first of foray into the sales world but actually I served in uh, I guess it was a couple of years of sales support so I'd visit with with salespeople to visit customers and talk about technical problems and look for opportunities um, yeah it's an interesting uh, there's an interesting convergence there an opportunity for, for technical people who want to broaden their exposure uh, you know lots of people fear getting in front of the customer <laughs> but, but that's a wonderful exposure customers pay the bills and um, the more exposure you've got to them and their problems the more effective uh, an employee can be uh, no matter what the role 
And I, I think now there's a lot of focus on entrepreneurism. You know, like technical people, they think that the jump is to go out and you know be an entrepreneur and start their company. I don't necessarily think that that's right for everybody. Um, and I think a lot of people work better within an organization. I think you're right, absolutely. And uh, you know, there's a lot of risk to being an entrepreneur. You need to drive your own uh, business opportunities. And so I agree with you. I think for a lot of folks, it's uh, best to stay within the comfort of an organization where you can balance uh, more effectively. Uh, you can work a nine to five job or eight mm -hmm. to six, whatever you choose that to be. Uh, and uh, you've got a supporting staff around you. It's it's quite a shock. I I, I was surprised to some extent I had some awareness, but when I stepped away from the large organization and employed 8,500 people across Canada and didn't have the support staff around me that I'd become accustomed to, that's a big change. And you can be mentally ready, but it's, it's a big change. Mm -hmm. And so when, so you did the technical side for a number of years and then into sales and marketing for a number of years inside the organization. And yes. then, then decided to go out yes and yes. What, what was that um what was the motivator to go out well the um you know through 30 years with the uh, nbtel bell alliant uh, bell canada and that's had a great career in many different uh, opportunities the primary motivation was first of all uh, an opportunity to retire and leave with a pension so that's a that's a tremendous mm -hmm. opportunity that few people get to uh, enjoy in our economy these days so for me the time was right uh, you know companies large companies go through a cycle where they're looking to downsize and I put my hand up and said you know look uh, it's about the right time for me and, and honestly uh, one of the motivators is I prefer to leave uh, leave at my age in a, in a state of comfort and leave uh, better opportunities for younger people who are still developing so um, I'd enjoyed most years of my career no one enjoys every, every mm -hmm. year and every experience but there was a uh, time to Time while I'm still young enough to do other things to move on and uh, and see what uh, see what I can develop. Hmm. And you you touched on something there that I think is really interesting about you know in this case it was Toastmasters, but I, I see it in in not just Toastmasters but in anything that it pushes people to grow their skills as they grow. They're they get more interested in growing. You know, it's like, it's almost like a I don't I don't know how to describe not like an addiction, but it's like a okay, I, I I can see that I improve myself, and now I would like to improve myself more, and then I would like to use those skills and so on. Yes, yeah, it's interesting. I you know one of the I uh, like was exposed to a theory, a motivational theory, some years ago. It's by an academic. Named David McClelland, he's passed away, and I don't think it's terribly popular, but it just made sense to me. So there's lots of theories about what motivates people, uh, but McClelland divides us into three three primary areas. He says we've all got elements of this, but one will dominate. So people are driven by a need for achievement, a need for power, authority, recognition, or need for affiliation. So uh, affiliation is the primary driver of team harmony. Need for recognition is the you know, need for uh, people to recognize what you've achieved in life. And the need for achievement is more internally driven. And, um, you know, you, so those are the folks that tend to be looking for new opportunities just to drive their skills. I'm in need for achievement. When I, when I read that and was exposed to it, it just made perfect sense to me. So it's a way that I view the world. And when I'm doing business with people, I'm doing an evaluation of what really motivates them. If I've got an opportunity, I think it might be worthwhile for them. I'm looking for uh, what motivates them. and uh, So I think a lot of people in Toastmasters are driven by uh, further need for achievement and mm. using their skills, developing their skills. And Toastmasters in particular, uh, where our mission is to work people become more effective communicators and leaders. And that's not only to serve Toastmasters, mm. that's to serve the broader world. So uh, I'm very excited when I see people doing that and making a contribution to the world. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, Toastmasters, well, being in Japan, there's a bit of a weirdness about Toastmasters. I, but I mean, I've only been in Japan for three years. And um, Toastmasters in Japan is different than my other experiences with Toastmasters. Um, 
because here it's kind of seen partly as an English club, you know, uh, okay. which is fair enough because that that also is a is a kind of achievement, you know, and it's certainly it's people learning to speak in a second language. Um, but Toastmasters is also, I, I think, about what like what you're kind of demonstrating is that um, you want to kind of help other people improve. Mm. You know, and that's something we learn in Toastmasters, you know, helping other people. We do. You know, it's interesting. I don't think most people come with that uh, goal in mind. But by participating in the environment, uh, those who stay realize, you know, uh, they contribute to the, to, the, to the culture, to the program. And they learn to give feedback to one another and encourage and coach and mentor. All words that are very popular in the business press these days. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm proud Toastmasters has evolved organically in a way that we really enable people to nurture and develop those skills. Because, because that sense of accomplish, achievement, like you're talking about, uh, I, I think, I mean, I kind of, I personally, I recognize that I'm an introverted person. Yes. And technology is great for somebody like me who also likes achievement because you can kind of sit in a room and, and have significant achievements, you know. Um, but if you're somebody who... Uh, when you go out and you want to make contact with people, you want to help them get an achievement. That's a different kind of, you know, you're getting achievement through other people. There's many ways to get achievement. Yes. I can get achievement by creating a great piece of software. Yes. I can get a sense of achievement. I can get a sense of achievement by starting a company and having lots of customers. Or I can get a sense of achievement yes. by helping somebody else improve themselves yes i think all those three examples they all come back to skills my skill is developing a great piece of software creating something from nothing um, the skill of, with dealing with people can be motivating someone coaching mentoring helping someone overcome an impediment or, or even recognizing something that's mm -hmm. holding them back so I, I for me the common denominator tends to be what skills being exercised so that's the need for achiever mm -hmm. <laughs> speaking it's always exercising a skill and looking for what's a new skill to exercise to help an organization or a person and to uh, stretch my capabilities so you're kind of you transfer your I don't know I maybe I'm going off on a tangent I'll cut this part out I don't know but you, you can you're kind of transferring that sense of achievement to you're getting a sense of achievement by helping another company get their achievement or by helping someone else get their achievements I view it a little bit differently I'd say the sense of achievement comes from identifying a problem uh, defining the problem well identifying alternatives and coming to a uh, deliver delivering a solution to the problem mm -hmm. cool. so, so in your role now as a consultant um, you're helping people overcome their problems I would imagine that's what a consultant ideally does uh, I suppose, and very much of the work these days is identifying opportunities and assessing opportunities, mapping that to organizational capabilities and desires, and choosing a path. So, um, in that sense, it's um, it's not quite problem solving, but it's identifying an opportunities and, uh, and potentialities. So, what kind of uh if you don't mind, what kind of consulting and what and what yeah. level are, are you working on? Well, there's a you know there's a discipline of, that's called business development, which is a bit of a catch-all phrase. But for me, it's the business development is, is more about assessing organizational capacity and new opportunities to develop, typically around new revenue opportunities. So I've been doing some people some help with some people determining uh, you know as they look at their growth opportunities, how should they approach that? I live in Atlanta, Canada, and um, so I'm doing some work with some of the Canadian. So should the growth come from Atlanta, Canada? Should it be national? Should it be within North America? Should they look internationally? If so, uh, what are some approaches to begin that to build those paths and, um, and, and starting on them? So, uh, so that's some business development work that I'm doing with uh, with some organizations. And so, you're working with organizations, larger organizations, primarily. Media, media, small to medium. Right. I, a lot of the stuff I'm doing, maybe because of my own background as a kind of solo entrepreneur and 
having started many businesses, I'm dealing with a lot of people who are also solo entrepreneurs are also looking to start their business and talking through people um, you know how do you start a business how do you know whether your business idea is a good business idea or not so people who are right at the be very beginning which I find that very exciting yes you know to go from nothing to a little bit of something um, Absolutely. but I, I, it's the same thing I find that one of the problems that solo entrepreneurs often have is that they often come from a technical background mm. and mm. often often have communication problems yes <laughs> to put it nicely <laughs> and often feel how come people don't see the brilliance of my idea yeah and you know that if they explain you know and i have the same problem myself sometimes that you explain things on a technical level and yeah. you know and, and i'm dealing that with that in a company you know i have a, a new business now and i and i bring and i get customers in and to me to me what the benefit of my solution is funnily enough is not the way they see it right yeah. and, and even though it's it, it's a lot of it is a how do I say uh, like kind of a communication issue that they don't they're not thinking about it from a technical point of view yes yes they're looking at the business problem they need solved right I, and, yes and so I'm saying I'm giving them the answer but I'm not saying it in a way that maps to there isn't that isn't that interesting? Which means that the sale might not take place. You know, you've got the solution, they've got the problem, and the communication means you never meet up. I was watching my hands on the video as I did that. I'm not sure my gestures were <laughs> great, but I think you get the idea. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, uh, reverting back to Toastmasters, uh, we we've been featuring some people who were in Toastmasters for short periods of time and uh, develop some great skills and it allowed them to do amazing things in the world. And one that I take great pride in is Jimmy Tai, T-H-A-I. He's actually originally from Vietnam. And um, so he became very successful at technology in Southern California, or this distinguished Toastmaster, highest award you can earn in Toastmasters. Uh, and now he builds schools in rural Vietnam. There's a, a part of it. It's a not-for-profit uh, initiative he's got. But he said, uh, he said, you know, Toastmasters gave him the ability to explain his ideas to people to get by him and that's that's what, what business is all about isn't it mm -hmm. it's about articulating the value we bring testing that the value is uh, perceived to have merit and, and closing some business so uh, that's a simplistic view of business but the, the, the power of communication skills is, is critical if we're going to be successful yeah i definitely think that that it, you know this thing about Toastmasters and I I really kind of I talk about Toastmasters quite a bit on my YouTube channel as well because for me I've always been a writer and that again comes down to the kind of this introverted side I can I can sit and I can write a you know a great blog post or a great story about something but to actually stand there and enunciate that um, you learn so much about the story when you say it out loud you do and there's a real uh, value in connecting with an audience and it's testing if the message is, is landing, whether that's visually or, or asking them, you know, is that clear? I remember many years ago attending a, a speech craft within Toastmasters and a gentleman got up and he gave a great technical speech on denial of service. He spoke for seven minutes in great detail and he sat down and I didn't know what denial of service was <laughs> after seven minutes. And I know now, but it was, it was a fascinating example for me. He had knowledge, he had passion, it was well written, well delivered, but it didn't hmm. not, not connect with me as an audience member. I think most of the audience. So uh, too much knowledge can be a bad thing. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it helps illustrate how a written a blog post or a book is different than a speech. A speech you need to test with the audience. You need to watch the reaction to see if communication is taking place. And I, I found for me that what I'm doing now is I often take kind of my bigger blog posts and before I post them, I actually give them at a, as a speech at Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. And then I find out, ah, oh, yeah, I missed, 
I forgot to tell people what a denial of service is. <laughs> You know, uh, or this kind of thing, because I, I had a blog post recently about, uh, you know, an Internet scam that was targeted at Japanese people. And uh, so I gave this speech. And as I, you know, after the speech, somebody came back and asked me, like, the most basic technical question. I went, oh, my God, I didn't, you know, I, I, I yeah. And, and, and as you demonstrated in uh, Osaka, you know this whole thing, this this curse of knowledge. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's a really interesting point. It's, it's fascinating to me um, how Toastmasters wasn't designed to help us with computers and blog posts and and deni giving speeches about denial of service, but it was something much more fundamental, you know. And so, so that's our strength, and it'll be our strength in the, for, for a long period of time. We we address very basic needs that humans have had for a long period of time and continue to struggle with the need to communicate effectively. And that means speaking, listening, writing, thinking, all those elements, and, and lead. And leadership is uh, everything from leading a large organization to protecting the self-esteem of colleagues around you. So uh, so we are really well positioned to, to help people for a long period of time. Hmm. But you're coming to your end as <laughs> Toastmasters International President. And it's uh, it's probably been a very long road to get there and so how are you going to transition out of that well i'm always cognizant of it and i'm always looking for the next best opportunity that's the need for achiever uh, achievement again so uh, we serve in this position for one year i remain on the board for another year so i will leave the board in vancouver in 2017 august uh, and i'll still have some responsibilities to the organization but um you know i'll, I'll I've, I've been holding back on the business opportunities so i'll start to dial those up i got involved with another not-for-profit organization called large it's in 36 countries around the world. It provides very respectful living accommodations and uh, communities for people with mental disabilities. So that's another opportunity for me to contribute and to test and develop my skills. So uh, I'm, I'm just somebody personally who's always looking for that next best opportunity to develop my skills and make a contribution. Hmm. And how do you end? Are you still... Is there still kind of the inner technical person inside of you? You know, do you do you find technology still interesting? Uh, to some extent, you know, I've got a couple of Android tablets. I still use a BlackBerry. <laughs> I'm not on the leading edge of technology. The laptop's a little bit old. Um, so I, I, I guess I like what technology enables for people. Uh, I think I'll get involved in some startup fields and startup opportunities. I like creating something out of nothing and solving problems for people. I'm very intrigued by uh, uh, Muhammad Yunus, who we gave a Golden Gavel Award mm -hmm. at our last yeah. this year, and what he's doing around... Um, Helping people in less advantaged uh, countries, and, and a part of that is technology. So, so yes, technology interests me, but not from a purely, um, what to say, not from a technical standpoint, but from the solutions that it enables for people. Right. I think that, but I, I think again, it, having a background in technology helps you understand the solutions it can, can provide. Yeah. It does. I really believe that someone's first career really shapes the way they think. So I, I still think very logically and programmatically. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's still the way I think to a large extent. And I, I think something about writing software lets you break stuff down as well. Absolutely. Really well. You know, and uh -huh. I think that's one of the things that helped me in starting businesses was I could say, okay, let's break it down into the things we need to do to get this business going. You know, and I think that's uh, oh, definitely a holdover from software, you know. Absolutely. Hmm. And so uh, one of the questions I had on here that I, I'm dying to ask for my own thing is, like I said, when I when I met you in Osaka, it kind of blows my mind a little bit that president of Toastmasters International is from St. John, New Brunswick. Yes. And and. And we talk about how Canadians always are get surprised when any Canadian does something. Uh, but how do you think that there's 
some advantages to that. It's very hard to kind of abstract out, I guess, but to say, oh, okay, you know, I came from this, so I don't have kind of like, you know, the cynicism of somebody from New York or whatever it is, you know. Yeah, I think there's some advantages. It's interesting, a young lady from uh, Ontario, Brooke Henderson, just won on the PGA Tour yesterday, 18 yeah. years old. Uh, so that's a wonderful achievement for another Canadian. I, I, I think a, a lot of people value you know, humility and people not taking themselves uh, too seriously. Um, but although I, I guess I'd also say Canadians can be uh, too humble at times. Um, we need to project confidence and our capabilities. Uh, and um, sometimes we hold back on that. So, uh, you know, uh, we can we can debate whether it's good or bad, but it just is. It's how mm. we're, we're pro we're programmed how we developed it in this culture to be to be generally a, a humble people and uh, you know proud of our successes but um, not overly aggressive in how we communicate those to the world hmm. now you mentioned um, Hofstede in one of your one of your talks and I've read some of his stuff as well and I, I just finished my master's degree actually last month and and uh, uh, Hofstadter was one of the things I went through in my master's, or taught, referenced in my master's, because I was talking about cross-cultural uh, business in Japan and, and and so on. And when I went through and did the filled out the survey, I was I don't want to say disappointed, but surprised at how much my responses pegged the Canadian national a average, you know. <laughs> And I, I think that just that is baked into us. There's something baked into us as Canadians, you know. Yes, and uh, it's interesting. I'm not sure how that happens, but it's just, I guess, that is the power of culture, isn't it? It's the power of uh, how we um, how we develop. We um, we take pride in certain elements, but mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're 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 sort of programmed to not be overly patriotic. Um, yeah, it's true. I, I guess it just relates to the power of culture, whether it's in the country or within organizations or even parts of the country. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's a fascinating thing for me. It's something that I I never really would have thought about. I never identified myself as Canadian because uh -huh. I've spent half my life outside of Canada. Hmm. And um, so I never thought, okay, I'm you know, uh, I have this thing. I understand, of course, that, you know, there's factors that will be there. But it was really surprised me to have such, that it was so close to the Canadian answers. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it really is, I think, this early life that we get baked into us, which is great, I think, you know. Yeah. I guess with some of our experiences, but when it comes back uh, at the core, well, that's formed very early. early. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's something I think. So you, you did, did you do an MBA? I did, I did here at the University of New Brunswick in St. John. Right. I finished that in 2013. Right. And was Hofstede and Drucker in your MBA? Uh, a little bit of Drucker, but I don't remember Hofstede being in my MBA. He was in my BBA, which I completed back in 1993. Right. But it was just something, again, that made sense to me. And it's actually pretty fun. So uh, anybody who's viewing, check it out, <laughs> Bert, uh, H-O-F-S-T-E-D-E. -E, and uh, you can plug in a couple of countries and compare the cultural dimensions. And uh, my favorites are the plug in Jamaica and Germany. And uh, just you see the... The differences around time orientation. Right. Exactly. And Green will put them in a in a meeting where they need to accomplish something in a short period of time. <laughs> yeah. Well, when when I first came to Japan, I I fell in love with Japan like you know, right off the plane. Lit I tell the story that literally in between getting off the plane and getting on the train from the airport, I said I'm going to live here. You know, it was yes. something about it was really appealing. But I always have to bracket it by saying that at the time I was living in Spain. In Spain, yes. Spain is kind of like the anti-Japan. Yes. You know, so there is, uh, you know, everything is relative, you know. You're the to the programmer in you. Yes, exactly, yes. <laughs> Not equal Japan. Trains run on time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Wow, this has been, uh, I'm really uh, appreciative that you took the time to talk with me. Uh, I might call this episode Smy and Kokochki. That way people won't be able to pronounce either of our last <laughs> names. <laughs> it, it's incredible to me that my last name, which is only three letters, K, 
can be mis mispronounced by 90% of the people who try. Actually, I spent a couple of months in Ukraine back in 1993 after I finished my BBA. So Ukraine borders mm -hmm. Poland, it's part of the Polish name. So he told me very clearly, you are saying your name is wrong. It should be Kokoski or Kokotsky is the, the Polish, um, Polish pronunciation. So my family says Kokotsky. We've been in Canada since the 1900s, early 1900s. So uh, that was interesting. Hmm. So Kokotsky would be the proper pronunciation of my name. All right. <laughs> Well, my name, you know, it's Smy, but almost 90% of the people say Smee, which drives me insane. Oh, well. Anyway, on that note, thank you so much. I, it's so great to have a Canadian Toastmasters international president. Great. Thanks very much, Jim. And I'll let you know when this is up and running. All right, Phil. Thanks very much. Okay. Have a good evening. All right. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. And so that was my interview with Toastmasters Internet, the international president of Toastmasters International, Jim Kokochi. This is my first ever interview on this channel. Really, I think maybe even the first interview I've ever done. So, you know, I'll get better. I'm very grateful for uh, Jim taking the time. We met in Osaka at the... Toastmasters Japan, or as they say, District 76 conference, and we chatted a few times there, and, and it was there that we kind of agreed it'd be great for him to come on and give me a chat. So I hope you learned something from him. I think it's interesting to see how other people approach the philosophy of business and their own personal philosophies of development, and I'm hoping that I'm going to have more people on. Well, I know I am. And that they'll also be interesting to you. So, thanks for watching. I'm Phil Smy, and we'll see you soon.